So this is video one for lab six, the pH experience for chemistry 112. And in this particular video, we're going to focus on understanding the importance of three or more samples in a calibration curve. And for this video, we're really referring to any calibration curve, but we're going to use the pH probe as an example when we calibrate the probe. Understand the importance of bracketing samples with the calibration curve. In other words, when I set up my calibration curve, I want to make sure the high calibration sample, the high concentration of the calibration sample, and the low concentration of the calibration sample bracket the samples that I'm about to measure. And then the other parts we're going to talk about is how to establish linearity on a calibration curve. And finally, we're going to literally show you the pH probe and show you how to do some measurements and proper use of the pH probe. So let's get started with just this idea that every instrument has a little bit of noise. So we're going to talk about the pH probe in particular. So now I've ran a pH um, 7 buffer sample, and I put it on the probe and just let the probe measure over time. And so I've graphed just about uh, just a little under two minutes of just measuring the pH probe. But that probe has a little plus or minus. So if, if you just look over 10 seconds, that's just the first 10 seconds. We've had variance from 6.98 all the way to 7.03. So it's certainly okay to say that this thing reads 7.0 consistently. So with a little bit of plus or minus at the tenth place, in fact, it has a little bit of plus or minus in the hundredth. But every instrument has a little bit of noise. So if I blew up just that first um, 100 seconds and really showed you around the, the pH 7, you'd see that there's electronic noise is what that is. And a lot of times that arises from different things. We've talked about this in past videos. But part of it has to do with using an alternating current circuit to run instruments. So with that in mind, we're just going to take a single pH point, and then the pH meter responds with voltage. So I'm just trying to show you that the, the instrument itself, if we say that we're reading a pH, for example, of 4, that's because the instrument picked up a voltage of about 0.4, but we also know there's a plus or minus on that. We just proved that. So the problem is, if you read at these different voltages, right, and you say, well, all I need is one voltage and get the corresponding pH, or at least two to do a calibration curve, right, you might be incorrect because I'm going to just show you what would happen. Let's just say we chose this point right here, and we chose this point right here, and we said, okay, we're just going to use those two points, and you could see that the calibration curve that would be set up across those two points would be an error. Okay, well, let's just try another couple points. Maybe that was just a fluke. Well, here's two more I took here and here, and sure enough, I've got a little bit of error. So what we learn is, Using just two calibration points is not acceptable because you're probably going to have pretty large error. If you use at least three, and when you do that and then do a linear fit, this is what we've learned to use Excel to do a linear regression line, which basically what it does is it puts as many points above as below, so it starts to work out that electronic noise, right? It averages it out and does this mathematical calculation. And then within that, um, it will then, it could give you an R squared. So we see that a three point calibration curve would be pretty good. So in a pinch, and sometimes what, in what we call an academic lab, where you're in push for time and you don't have time to repeat calibration curves over and over, we might accept three points. But in research, what you want to do is have multiple points. So that's always best. So, you know, five or more. So even here with five points, we've put a linear regression line on there. 
And this now is what we're going to use for the calibration curve because this line that we've established um, through calculations puts as many points above as below. And then we've averaged it out. So we've basically been able to average out the error over five points. And then what we finally do is we express it with this R squared value. And so R squareds are a little hard to read because we don't understand all the statistics of them. We don't teach you all the statistics, but you may go forward and take statistical analysis or statistics class and learn all that. But basically what we would say is, if you're working in an academic lab, we may lower those standards a little because you don't always have time to redo all your calibration curves. But if you were trying to do this for some sort of industrial standard, you'd want at least a 0 0.990 to be acceptable linearity to use a calibration curve. And what we would say with that is that establishes a linear trend. Now, the other thing is, is has to do with bracketing and why do we establish a linear trend? So let's just talk about this. So I, I, what I've gone back to some data we've already done in this class where we did the zero order graph of crystal violet. We did a kinetics experiment. And so if you'll just basically graph this, this compound, this crystal violet compound that's, we're measuring it on a, uh, a spectrophotometer now. And so what we have is the, it looks like about five points that we just measured. This is from an experiment. This isn't a calibration curve, but it's just from an experiment. And we've taken five points and measured them over time. And what we would say off of this is, well, certainly that is actually a linear trend. And so what a lot of people want to do with that is they want to say, well, we don't have to say, if this had been a calibration curve, for example, they would go, okay, well, we don't have to bracket because we can extrapolate. So extrapolate means take the data that you already have that's established, use the trend and extrapolate beyond the boundaries of that data. So here's the the low time on this, and I could say, well, then at times prior, this is what the concentration would be doing. And here's the high time. And we'd say, well, all times after that, you could just extrapolate and figure out what the concentration would be doing. This is kind of that same idea of like, if I build a calibration curve, then I can just assume that samples that are even higher concentration than my calibration curve are going to fit on the line because it's a linear trend. So I took this example that you're familiar with just to prove that this isn't this isn't proper thinking. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to not extrapolate. I'm going to run the experiment out to these times. And so now that little point we were working on was right there. And what you can see is certainly in those five, six seconds around 100 seconds, we would have gotten a linear trend. But if you'll run over the full 200 second, you'll see that this certainly isn't a linear trend. And so that's the fallacy of extrapolating. Sometimes we do a little of that, again, in an academic lab because we don't have time. But I don't, I don't want to mistrain you guys so that if you move forward, or you ladies, as you move forward, into science, I don't want to mistrain you. You need to always bracket your calibration curves um, around the samples you're measuring. Or in other words, make sure if you know the sample concentration or if you've taken a, a, a measurement of the sample, then you want to make sure your calibration curve sets up to bracket that. So that is the, the, the point. So here's the summary that I would say. You need at least three calibration curves for anything you're doing in the academic labs. And if you're working out of academics, then you're going to want to do, you know, as you go on and do more research, you're going to want to do at least five calibration points. You need to bracket samples um, between your high and low calibration points. You want to establish linearity over the range in which you are working. And just to kind of put this at ease, if you're doing 
um, acceptable research work, an R squared of greater than 0 0.990 would be considered acceptable. So in this next section of the video, what we're going to work on is actually um, calibrating and then using the pH probes. So that pH probe has a, a cylinder that's filled with a fluid of a certain uh, ionic concentration of pH. So it has to be stored in that little white sample bottle that has the exact same ionic concentration. That way it won't uh, leak by osmotic pressure. And so we leave it stored in that bottle. And in order to uh, release the probe, you have to loosen the cap on that storage bottle. That will relieve the pressure on the O-ring. And then you're ready um, to start using the probe. And the probe is now ready to be rinsed and used. We always rinse it. We have a little rinse vial there. So just rinse the solution off into the catch vial. She's going to dry off the pH probe with uh, paper. Now notice that she doesn't do a lot of rubbing. She, what she does is dabbing because if you, if you really run that paper up and down that uh, pH probe, sometimes you'll build up static electricity. So that's the first buffer solution. So it's pH 11. It's in that uh, little vial. So she's going to set that up in there and let it settle in. So here's an alternative way to mount those on pH probes. Get your three-finger clamp, get the smaller one, or you can get a standard uh, barrette clamp. And then what you can do is put those on a ring stand, not both of them, but either one you want to use, and use that to mount your pH probe. And that way, you won't have to worry about knocking over your sample or your pH probe, and you can just lower it down into the solution when you're ready to make a measurement. And then we're going to zoom in on the um, GLX. So first off, uh, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, that's sensors. So you can arrow over, and then we drop down with F4 and select Calibrate. And what we're going to do is a two-point calibration. And so now she's setting that first point at 11.00. And then it's reading, and when she pushes read F3, what that does is it says, hey, register the, the voltage right now and call that 11.00. Now she's going to change out her solution. Rinse it off. So she does a rinse there and then does another rinse and just kind of some um, a kind of a DI water catch off to the side so she can do a more extensive rinsing. And again, does a little dabbing to get rid of that excess water. So now this is pH 4. Sets it in there. She's already set in. 0.2 is set at, at 4.00, so she's going to reach in there. And then she said read, which said that locked, that 0.4. And then she said accept. So now we've taken a point at uh, pH 11, and we've taken a point at pH 4. So we would be kind of stuck right now because we've basically done a two-point calibration curve. But watch what she does. It's kind of a slick way to kind of get a third point in there without setting up the calibration curve that way. What she's going to do is she's going to drop it in a pH 7 buffer. And if that reads within 0.1, then um, that'll be like the third calibration point. 
There we go. And now this is also instructive for you to know that the pH that we read in the lab is good to the tenths point. And so now we're going to just do a, a measurement. It's been calibrated, calibrated, and we're going to actually do a measurement of the 0.03 magnesium hydroxide. And this is an example. So again, so when you're done with the pH probe for the day, what you want to do is the same. Remove, rinse, and uh, rinse it well. And then you're going to dry it off again with the Kim wipes. We do more blotting than we do rubbing. All right. And the last step is you want to put it back in the, the storage solution. And so you want to loose, uh, loosen that cap up a little bit. That'll, re, uh, that'll allow that O-ring to be open. You can replace that pH probe in there. Make sure it's below the solution level. And then when you tighten the cap, it's going to re-tighten uh, re the O-ring so that it's waterproof. And now you can store that. And if it falls over, you won't lose liquid, and then the inner uh, liquid inside the uh, pH probe won't leak out. So today we were able to look at the essentials of a good calibration curve, that it should have at least three points. Um, you saw ways to establish linearity with um, using your R-squared factor. You learned to um, bracket samples and Put high and low calibration samples up around where you're going to actually be sampling in the lab. Then we broke off and talked about using the pH probe, um, how that you want to keep that pH probe in a storage solution that has an equal ionic strength of what's inside the pH probe itself. That way it won't the solution that's in the probe won't leach out. We talked about proper technique for rinsing between uses, um, how to calibrate the PASCO pH probes in particular. And then we showed you how in an academic world you could use a pH 7 to give you a third point on a calibration uh, curve. And I hope this helps. See you in the lab.